Hello everybody uh, and welcome to this fifth webinar on open source verification. Uh, my name is Henrietta Wilson. I'm really pleased to be working on this project with Dan Flesch and Alama De Samuel from SOAS University and thank you to them for all their support in getting these webinars together and of course to the SOAS Scrap students uh, who are instrumental in making it all happen. Um, we have another three really exciting speakers lined up for us today. We have Ali Arbia from ACAPS uh, and Daniel Liu from King's College London Project Alpha and Dan Plesh from SOAS. Uh, so I'll be handing over to them in a moment. Um, but before I do so, as usual, I'm going to say a few introductory comments about where we're at uh, in this webinar uh, series. Um, so this is the fifth webinar We've had four webinars so far and we have another two planned. So it's really worth taking stock of what we're learning, some of the things that are emerging uh, from, from this work. Um, so just to give you a really quick overview, in the webinars we've had so far, we've had 15 speakers from different organisations doing different sorts of open source verification. Now we've got another three in this one, we'll have another eight in the two remaining webinars. So a really diverse mixture of people. And on top of all of that, behind the scenes, I've been having lots of research conversations with different open source practitioners around the world. So there's a lot of different stuff uh, coming out of these conversations. Um, and I want to just start by foregrounding this sense that open source research is a real growth area. There's a lot of it happening around the world with very different approaches, uh, with very different attitudes and roles. And lots of these have kind of connections and are interrelated and are addressing overlapping themes. Um, but lots of them are quite independent and separate from each other as well. Uh, so I'm just going to share my slides again to sum up some of the themes that I've been thinking about uh, in my in my conversations and work um, so oh this isn't working I'll have another go at that <laughs> sorry this is taking me a little while I'll be there shortly there we go um, so, uh, what I've been finding out is some sort of overlapping themes that are emerging from these conversations. As I said, there's all sorts of different types of monitoring and they're doing different sorts of things. So through the webinars, we've seen examples of open source research that's been fundamentally aimed at correcting misinformation. And I point to Richard Guthrie's case study of the Yellow Rain incident uh, uh, a historical piece of research um, by Julian Perry Robinson and Matt Messelson, in which through open sources, they managed to dispel allegations of use of biological warfare in South Asia. So it's really important that open source researchers, non-governmental researchers can correct false allegations. Um, apart from that, I think open source research is really usefully uncovering a bunch of unknown information in, in different categories. So some of, the, some of the projects we've seen have been uncovering things that people know are unknown. Uh, Jamie Whithorn gave an example of her research looking at sanctions uh, in uh, North Korea um, where she knew that some of the tracking processes were being evaded. Um, so you start to think about how you find out about what you know you're, you don't know. There's also been examples of projects uncovering unknown unknowns and tracking flows of, of information, piecing together, triangulating different sources of information to put together a compelling uh, piece of information, a, a picture of what's going on in a, in a place that was thought to be hidden. There's also differences in this open source work of the sorts of political impact people are trying to achieve. So the sorts of work that I'm interested in are really concerned with sort of progressive politics, projects that are trying to make the world a better place in some sort of way. There is other sort of open source intelligence work, um, which is maybe more commercial, uh, 
or, or doing other sorts of things. But the, the focus of this set of webinars is really on uh, the small non-governmental organisations and research groups that are trying to increase transparency, either to empower citizens or to inform decisions uh, in, in different sorts of ways. Um, so we've seen examples of those sorts of things through the webinars. We've also had discussions around can open source research, can open source verification be more than the sum of its parts? And we thought about different opportunities and challenges for doing this. Um, so the opportunities may be revolve around can uh, projects be coordinated in some sort of way? Is there, uh, are there opportunities to share information, share technology? Challenges. I think it's definitely an open question uh, how this sort of work could be harnessed to be more than it's doing already. Um, uh, so I'll be interested to see if we can explore that more in this webinar. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, I'll just now very quickly outline how this webinar is going to work. We're going to have three short talks. Throughout those talks, please do feel free to post any questions or comments via the chat function. And if you do so, if you could add your name and affiliation, uh, that'd be great. I mean, I guess I have your name anyway, but your affiliation would be very helpful if you're happy to share that. The presentation side of this webinar will finish at around three o'clock, uh, and then we'll move to more informal discussions. So if people then are happy to share uh, their video and their chat, uh, that would be great. Okay, so now uh, I'm delighted to be able to hand over to Ali for his presentation. Uh, Ali works at ACAPS, and I know he'll be saying um, a bit about his work. Yeah, thank you very much, Ali. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm, I will try to share my screen. I hope. Um, So it's the first time I'm doing this on Zoom. Can you already see my screen? If not... Um, not yet, Ali. Um, okay. Um, otherwise, I'll do it without the presentation because it's not... Um, okay. There we Can go. you see my screen now? Yes, thank you. Good. Um, okay, so sorry for that. <laughs> um, do, do you see the slider? Do you also see the big like this? Is, does that work? Um, Does, do, you, do you see the screen now? Sorry. You're fine. Okay, yeah. thank you. Sorry. Okay, nice. so um, yeah, as Henrietta said, I'm, so my name is Ali Arbia. I, before I start, just a little bit, a little grain of salt. Um, I'm relatively new to ACAP, so I've worked for ACAPS now for half a year, but I'm definitely new to the humanitarian sector. So I hope I do justice to the work of my colleagues. Um, I can by now fairly competently talk about my own work. But um, so I, I hope that I'll be able to answer questions if there are questions, but I might have to uh, double check with my colleagues later and come back to you um, to give you some of the answers. The way I wanted to structure this presentation is I'll give you a little bit of context who we are and what we do, because I think that we are probably our work is a little bit different from most other people who have presented so far in this series or will present. I will quickly give you an idea of what we do and then I'll come to the main part, which is how do we do it? Because I think this is probably the part that is most interesting. A lot of this will be about, um, about how, we, how, how we do the work and less about the sources specifically or what kind of sources you work with, but you will see um, why I have structured it that way. So ACAPS, um, we have, we are a team of probably now about 40 people. Um, we have hubs in Bangladesh, Colombia. Um, I'm based in Geneva, where the biggest group is working, where a lot of the ana analysis is happening. 
Um, you have various donors, um, they change a little bit every year. I, this is the most up-to-date slide I could find. And in terms of governing structure, um, we have a consortium that is, um, is in charge. And so we, it's composed of the Norwegian Refugee Council and Save the Children. So what do we do? There are four um, areas where we are active. Um, we do analysis and um, tailored support. This is what my team does quite a lot of. Um, we also do capacity building. So we have humanitarian training courses, uh, a program and advocacy. For this presentation, I will mainly talk about analysis um, because this is what, is what is relevant for the topic here. Um, so just what the, ter the type of analysis we do, we, we work on global comparisons, we do trend analysis, we look at risks, um, multiple crises in one country, uh, crisis going across national borders. I think to get an idea, I invite you to go to our website, you will see um, everything we do is published there, also databases, etc. So I, I think if you're interested, I invite you to go to our website. That's probably the best way to get more familiar with our work. Um, so the typical outputs you'll find there are, um, we do online crisis analysis. These are very short pieces. Um, Briefing notes, this is a lot coming out of my team. Um, they are supposed to be timely and very focused. I will get back to that in a minute. And then we have more in-depth thematic reports. We do anticipatory reports and um, trying to do scenario building and, and risk analysis. Of course, this, depending on what we are working on or my colleagues are working on, this also um, means that the approach is slightly different as well as, as the sources that are, are used for that. So to get to, to, to the meat of the presentation, and that's what, that what you're probably most interested in is, um, so how do we do that analysis? And I, I'd like to start with the specific challenges we're facing, because I think this is, um, this is the interesting part, how we try to solve challenges. Some of them will be familiar to you. Others probably um, are quite specific to, to what the kind of work we do. So the first challenge is um, timeliness. So we often work on um, very short time spans. So for example, my team, the rapid analysis team, um, we get regular alerts and requests for um, briefing notes that we have to deliver within 24 hours. A lot of traditional um, databases, information that you can find is not updated on um, such a short-term basis. So this is one thing we, we, we need to find solutions for. Then the specificity of some of the, the requests we get, um, often it's about the humanitarian crisis that is um, very localized. So we're really talking about a, a specific um, district in the country where you might not have a lot of information to begin with. Um, or sometimes it's thematically very specific, meaning that actually you need the input of, some, of, of someone with, with technical knowledge um, and technical expertise, which again, we do not necessarily have in-house. Um, in and then that's probably familiar to most of you. So you always end up having conflicting or unclear information um, because it's often about rapidly developing crisis. Um, the number today will not be the same like in two days when we talk about floods or earthquakes, etc. And in addition, a problem that we have is that <laughs> the best information usually, usually is available um, with the organizations on the ground that are um, that are there but they of course have their own incentives and biases when they report things and there are questions of and I, I mean that in the most neutral way possible but there are questions of um, funding of, of organizational um, specialization etc so what we are trying to do is to come in and give a less biased 
version of the situation and provide information that the humanitarian decision makers on the spot can make the right decisions and hopefully um, help more, more people that way. So in terms of sources we are using, that's nothing exciting at all. Um, we base ourselves on, on new sources that you can, that are open openly accessible. Um, we have, we often go back to specialized reports because if you write about things like um, nutrition or, or um, wash facilities, etc., you often you need some organizations that have a, a specific expertise. So like the um, OCHA or the World Food Organization. Um, and then we also try to use um, our own network and contacts we have. We had an attempt building that network up, but it's it's difficult to have <laughs> to to keep a formal network up, um, and and also to have the right people because uh, if you cover the globe and the information you need is often very specific and localized. Even if you have a, if you have a vast network of of, of expertise and, and and local knowledge that you hit exactly that spot that you need to hit is 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 not obvious so this is this is my last slide and this is actually the the one that is is the important slide so how do we try to solve these challenges and and how do we approach uh, the work so one thing is we we aim for good enough. So not, not for very good or perfect, but good enough. The idea is that, um, that the people on the ground or, or people interested in, in, in reading our products, that they get the information they need. Not as much information as possible, but that we really try to target to give them um, what they need and as detailed or not detailed as it is needed. We also um, often say, so we try to make sense, not data. It's always easy to throw a lot of data at people, but I think what we try to do is really give the value added with the interpretation of the data, doing the, the analysis. Um, the line is not always that clear when you switch from just, as I said, throwing data at people to um, providing the interpretation to the data. And then the last point for the good enough is that um, we also try um, if so for example in my work <laughs> if we have 24 hours to provide a briefing note um, the art is not necessarily to find the information but the what is difficult is to say okay this 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 is this is enough this is what people need this is enough to take a decision so it's it's, it's more about um how yeah how, how to find that point when things are good enough um then we work a lot with templates and workflows and i think again this is this is specific to the challenges we face so um if you want to be as timely as possible um we work with templates so we don't have to um, start from zero every time it also makes training of analysts a lot easier. You will see why, but we have a quite a big turnover in terms of analyst, analysts. So working with templates makes that part of the, the data collection um, and analysis much more efficient. The same for workflows. So we do, for example, the, um, we have the crisis insight team. They, they give cri ratings of crisis. You, you can also find that on our work web page. And there are also um, quite precise workflows, so it's easy to train people. It, it um, assures a certain um, coherence across time. And so again, it, it makes training easier. We also produce our own data sets. Um, so far we had um, crisis insight, but also um, access. We have now with COVID-19 two new data sets where we, and I'll get back to that um, experiment a little bit um, with the data collection. So we have um, one on government measures that were taken and one on the secondary impact that's all new um, for, of COVID-19. 
the way we approach that, um, these two data sets is so we have student volunteers all across the globe, which uh, allows us to diversify also a little bit the points of view and to um, have more local, we onboard them and there's quite a, a, a turnover, but um, with established um, procedures, we, we can manage that quite well. And the last point is, so we do something similar for the analysis. So a big part of our analysis is done by trainee analysts. We have a trainee program where analysts come in for a year. We give them a, a way of, of starting in the um, humanitarian analysis um, area, give them trainings, provide them um, with guidance so they learn on the job. And at the same time, we get some valuable analysis out, out of, of that system. But this is why we have the need of having, uh, uh, um, being able to deal with a big turnover and still um, provide a certain coherence um, and, and consistency in what we do. So this is a brief summary how we work. You might have noticed, so I put a lot of emphasis on um, 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 procedures, processes, because I think this is probably what is most interesting for you and what is the more innovative part of, of the way we function. Um, yeah, so I'm done with my slides. If you're interested in more information, please don't hesitate to go to our website or, or ask questions. Um, now I try to unshare my screen. Good. <laughs> Thank you, Ali. That was a fantastic uh, 10 minutes, uh, giving us a really clear flavour of how far-reaching ACAPS is. I mean, this umbrella term for humanitarian monitoring, you're covering so many different sectors, so many different locations, and often in a really speedy way. So you gave a really interesting uh, uh, insight in how, to, how you reconcile the need for very speedy responses with being accurate and how you go for a good enough client focused solution to that, uh, which seems great to me. I just wanted to follow up before handing over to the next speaker. In, in earlier webinars, there's been mention of how disinformation and misinformation uh, on the internet can really complicate open source research. And I wondered if you're in your work, you're, how you guard against this, uh, how, how it interrupts your work, um, and, and, and I would think that that's particularly challenging when you're working across different geographies because there's such cultural specificity in how people report on things, how they're regarded. Uh, so I, I don't know if you can comment on that at all now or if you'd like to um, wait I, a moment. Yeah, I, I, I can try to. So <laughs> um, I'd say in so far it has not been a a huge problem for us. I guess it has to do because a lot of a lot of um, information you're working on is 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 actually quite technical. So it it goes back to things like nutrition, shelters, non-food items. So it's less of an issue. I think it probably we we have slight problems like this when it comes then to the broader context uh, in in the context of armed violence, um, but. As this is not the, the, the core of our work, um, mostly can be solved also by um, uh, avoiding certain ambiguity just by being very transparent, what we know, what we don't know. But uh, it's, it's not central usually to what we write about. So this is, this is quite easy. And I think the second point why it's not a big problem is because we have to work in on such short notice or we, we, we try to be as speedy as possible. Um, I mean, one way of, of doing it is also you, you just have certain sources you always come back. Um, certain databases, certain um, sources of information. And so in, in a certain sense, it's almost like um, we have some sources, some trusted sources, almost like pre-selected. Um, and they usually build the core of, of, of what, we, what we write about. Great, uh, great answer. So I think that's, I, I, we've heard similar things from other speakers uh, over the course of the webinars in different, uh, different uh, 
uh, balance between those different aspects. So yes, transparency, making, making clear where you've got your evidence from and not over claiming on your conclusions. Um, and also uh, tracking things isn't just a matter of getting a slam dunk piece of data. It's about building uh, confidence and knowledge and expertise over time. And some of that is through building trusted networks uh, that you can rely on, yeah. Thank you very much, Ali. Uh, I'm now going to introduce uh, Dan Yu uh, from King's College London, Project Alpha. Thank you very much, Daniel. It'd be great to hear from you. Hi, everyone. Can everyone, can everyone hear me? Yes, thank you. Great. Yes. Uh, I'm just going to quickly try and share my screen. Stand by, please. Can everyone hear that? Uh, can everyone see this? Yes, thank you, Dan. Amazing. All right, here we go. Uh, so uh, again, thank you, thank you uh, very much, Henrietta, and um, uh, for for inviting us to be here. Um, my name is Dan Liu, um, and I am a researcher at King's College London at the uh, Center for Science and Security Studies. I'm going to, uh, following from Ali's uh, uh, discussion uh, and sort of really, really great insight into the sort of strategic level humanitarian analysis, I'm going to bring it down uh, to a very, very tactical level um, example of the, the level of frustrations and the sort of the trials and tribulations of, a, um, of, 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 of open source verification and, uh, and sort of following up on uh, publicly, uh, publicly uh, known information but, but using open sources. Um, so uh, a bit about what we do first. Um, so Project Alpha, we are a knowledge transfer program with Thinking Cells London, and we specifically focus on sort of informing and skilling up practitioners in, in specifically the non-proliferation uh, fields. Uh, so basically that includes sanctions, strategic trade controls, um, proliferation finance, and so on. Um, so. Uh, in the sort of the inv investigation side of house, we use a range of open source uh, tools and techniques to sort of study all aspects of non-proliferation from its financing to its sanctions evasion uh, networks to uh, how these um, to how uh, to how these networks uh, grow, uh, change, and uh, and all these other dynamics. Um, of course, the are uh, uh, the traditional targets of uh, of sanctions investigation and non proliferation um, non proliferation investigations obviously involve around the DPRK, um, but we also have specific technical safeguards on nuclear safety um, uh, as part of CSS. Uh, the maritime uh, and China uh, uh, China are aspects that we all uh, we also um, uh, look uh, look a lot into, and also strategic trade com uh, control policy, uh, proliferation finance policy, as well as uh, Throwing more interesting and innovative ideas, such as uh, uh, using sort of mass data sets, uh, uh, data fusion, and also applying a bit of machine learning into um, into uh, enhancing and ma making analyst workflows better. So, I'm going to sort of specifically talk about one case, and that case is COMID in uh, in Sudan. So what? So in this is a case that the the UN panel of experts on. Uh, on North Korea have been following for a very long time. And it is uh, a case where uh, after the, the UN panel of experts have gotten information from a nation state, uh, they, uh, they were informed that the North Korean government and the Sudanese government were, uh, were in cooperation to, trans to transfer series of uh, one, two, two mil uh, precision guided mun munitions and also air attack uh, satellite guided missiles from the DPRK to, to Sudan. Uh, they, uh, they knew from um, information provided by, by them from a nation state that um, it involved a company called Future Electric Company that, that ostensibly was in China. And also they had, and also Korea Mining Development Trading um, Corporation, which is a, or COMID, which is a, a known DPRK, um, Gun running, uh, gun running cover shell network uh, is sort of the, the main instigator behind the, this drill transaction. So, 
after picking after picking apart the UN panel of experts report, so we kind uh, we can kind of already see some uh, some interesting leads. One is sort of the the key key individuals involved um, that was uh, that was uh, said by the um, by, by the panel uh, from the DPRK side. We also know uh, oh, that we also know that the that the, uh, the that the UN uh, the UN panel of experts also also have knowledge of a uh, of a shell company uh, that's resident in China uh, that's specifically in the Haidan district of Beijing, and we also know that Future Electric Company is is sort of the uh, the main sort of uh, vehicle of which this transaction is uh, is taking place. But this is where things starts getting a bit um, interesting because Future Electric Company sounds an incredibly generic, and then when you have the wide variety of ways that you can sort of uh, permu uh, permutate and, com and combine different ways of uh, uh, making this name um, in various, uh, in various uh, languages uh, in the jurisdictions involved in Chinese, in Korean, in English, uh, in Romanized, uh, in Romanized, Eng in Romanized uh, Korean, in Romanized Chinese, or in Arabic. Um, all of these starts to, you start getting an incredibly large list of of, of, of probable selectors for you to start your search with. And so, what we typically what we typically do at Project Alpha is we all, we look at corporate registries uh, that are pub that is open and publicly available by um, by any member of the public. So the so these are uh, the best example in the UK is Companies House, where you uh, plonk in uh, a uh, a name of a company, and they should have the company details because it's a matter of registering a company in a jurisdiction. So, for example, of this, we uh, we used something similar in um, in Nigeria, uh, where we had uh, the where we had Jenko, which is another uh, North Korean uh, sanctions evasion network. So, as you can see here, um, this is a pretty relatively open and shut case. We have uh, DPR, uh, DPRK addresses, and we and we know exactly when they were. Um, uh, when they were registered. In the case of Sudan, however, um, what, we, what we would have relied on is not available. Um, uh, according to the Open, uh, uh, the open Data Index, uh, company registry, the company register in, in, in Sudan is, uh, is very much closed uh, to sort of uh, members of the public and uh, it's, it, it is not available for us uh, to sort of use. Okay then, um, that's that, that that's a step backwards, but we can also think about other ways of uh, getting at this problem. What about methods of transshipment? We know that in order for in order for our, uh, a shipment to go from a, uh, case A to B, there have to be th there have to be vectors. There have to, um, so you, so you things we have to consider is uh, the types of okay if it's maritime then okay maybe they're using uh, different sh uh, different shipping companies uh, in in China okay and then and and through South Sudan. But then uh, maybe uh, previous um, previous webinars have also uh, told how complicated maritime shipping um, analysis is, and sort of all the sort of all, all, all sort of the AIS drifting and dark activities that um, uh, maritime networks engage in to sort of evade uh, evade detection. Um, so that that's something that we need to be going consider. Second, uh, okay, what about through air? We know that air courier is heavily sanctioned, and we uh, and we have. Uh, uh, we and there are public data uh, data sets and uh, web uh, and sort of uh, platforms that actively monitor sort of the the current position of entire fleets of of, uh, of commercial airlines. We, uh, that could be a possibility. Um, and what and what about through what about through land? We knew we know that from uh, from the UN panel of experts reports that uh, a lot of the DPRK agents that uh, that came through and sealed the deal w uh, were. Accredited or traveling through Egypt, maybe um, maybe that was kind of, maybe that was sort of the route, land route that was through here. So that so that involves so as you can see here, even just even with that uh, has an incredible large array of possibilities and a large array of sort of meth, uh, and sort of avenues of investigation that it, that an individual analyst will have to will have to go through and track down. So sometimes we get lucky. Sometimes we get bills of lading data that are specifically point us to uh, uh, point us to a specific transaction. Um, so the bills of lading da uh, data are um, uh, for uh, for those um, uh, unfamiliar are sort of pieces of uh, pieces of um, sort of declarations that a sh 
uh, that when a consignee sort of uh, ships something, will have to declare to, uh, to the customs authority of who, who am I, where am I sending it to, who, uh, who's going to receive it, uh, what, what is my address, uh, what, what is inside, and so on and so forth. Sometimes that's, uh, that's commercially or publicly available. And uh, we can get, we can get, uh, and we can get sort of the type of specific technical, tactical level data of who sent what where. Unfortunately, and uh, uh, if, unfortunately in this case, um, you uh, this is this is not the case. So we, so we we through this um, particular transaction, we looked for China to Sudan, and with the uh, with the keywords of Future Electric as a company, but we get fifth. We get a lot of these hits, but none of them really sort of match uh, the time frame or sort of the the uh, the typology of um, of the companies we're looking for. So no no dice there. Okay, so maybe we uh, so what about we expanded a bit more further? Maybe we just look beyond uh, just the two companies uh, to look to the other parts of the network. Okay, we're getting a bit desperate here, but let's uh, let, let let let's have a go. So. This is what we know of the current um, the current network of, uh, in Sudan, as, as told by the UN panel of experts. Maybe we can re uh, maybe we can branch it out to the uh, to the rest of the continent. Okay, this is getting a bit complicated. Complicated. We have all of these networks. We have all of these uh, individuals, um, and also um, roaming around different areas, doing different things, and setting up their own shell companies. That's th that's going to be a bit difficult to, uh, to track, but thankfully we've got uh, a large amount of uh, corporate registry data that's publicly available. We can part, uh, we can we can maybe start tracking some of this. Let's let's go in a bit more deeper. Oh no, this is a, this is this is starting to get a bit messy, and this is kind of uh, and once you sort of like start uh, mapping out the different networks and companies from every single piece of um. Uh, Every single piece of data from uh, their shell, from every sort of shell company, every uh, linked uh, linked company to shell companies, or companies that were listed by the UN Panel of Experts report, or companies that were sanctioned, that you get something like this: an incredibly nebulous network of shell shell companies, intermediaries, that w maybe one could be the could be the needle that you're looking for. Maybe one could be the sort of the transaction or, or the key in intermediary that, that that is doing this uh, that, that is that is doing this specific tra uh, transshipment. And this is to say nothing about the type of um, type of financing mechanisms that uh, that these uh, that these sort of networks are going are going with. Uh, so this is an example of a of Glocom, uh, which is a um, which is another network affiliated with Comid um, that, uh, and this is uh, this is what we uh, have put out in 2017 about one particular network's uh, financial sort of um, uh, proliferation finance mechanisms. As you can see here, multiple jurisdictions, multiple uh, multiple layers of, of shell companies to hide the fact that a transaction is going from um, from one jurisdiction and ultimately to the DPRK. So I guess all of this sort of like large scale um, hunt for essentially what, what ended up to be a really, really unfruitful sort of uh, investigation kind of highlights a couple of things. Um, one is detecting it, single transshipments is challenging and, you, and you've seen that, but imagine if you're trying to scale that into a global transshipments um, sort of uh, mechanism, that's going to be even more challenging. The second is you, you might have seen a China comes up again and again and again. China's centrality in global trade makes it essential for future arms and trafficking and verification efforts. Um, what, the extent of which the Beijing, um, Beijing authorities is able to cooperate with the international community and their willingness to share data, to share, uh, to enhance their export controls um, is going to be crucial for, uh, for how we tackle sort of um, conventional arms shipments. This is, oh, I've shown you a case only for a very, very tiny case, but um, if you look at sort of uh, Nigeria, sort of Fulani, uh, Herzman conflicts, um, you'll see that the most majority of seized, um, seized ammunition come from China. If you look at the compo componentry for um, the avionics behind drones in uh, the Houthi uh, Yemen conflict, you'll see a lot of the componentry ultimately come from, um, uh, come, um, come from Chinese manufacturers. Um, again, central uh, centrality makes them, uh, makes them pivotal for future verification efforts. Third 
is that open source verification alone has its limits. Um, you, you've seen how uh, a, a desk-based researcher um, from 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 thousands of uh, from thousands and thousands of miles uh, with uh, with limited no, uh, with limited knowledge of local context, uh, limited knowledge of lang uh, local language uh, will, will butt up against a lot of uh, challenges. And and it it is vital to sort of uh, to part, uh, for open source investigators to to partner up and link uh, their research techniques with local activists, uh, academics, journalists uh, to sort of enhance uh, enhance and sort of complete the cycle, the com complete the information cycle, if you will. Um, so that's kind of the three my three takeaway points. Um, this concludes my brief. Uh, are there any questions? Daniel, thank you so much. What an amazingly uh, rich, another really rich uh, uh, exploration uh, and uh, showcase of, of what open source, re open source research looks like. Um, you know, you really gave a, a flavour to me of a treasure hunt that you're, that there's uh, uh, researchers kind of trying to collect min minute bits of information and put them together to find something and maybe you'll get the treasure, maybe you won't, you just don't know uh, at the end. Uh, you, you made me think of all sorts of things. I think your, your point about it's essential to get China on board is really interesting and uh, 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 is worth exploring further. Last week we had a presentation um, from Faya Lezhnevska about the Chinese uh, mobilization of the digital earth idea. So trying to coordinate uh, tracking of environmental things in, in, in to, to, to try to address climate change. Um, and she pointed out it's not straightforward. Uh, this thing, this, this is very difficult. I myself has found it quite hard to connect to uh, Chinese open source researchers, which may or may not seem obvious, but I'd be really interested to hear any thoughts you have about how, how that could be made to happen, because we'd be really interested in doing that. Um, uh, I'm also, I was also very interested by your presentation, your, your sort of idea that what you're doing is you're collecting whatever openly available information that there is, whether it's from Companies House or the Maritime Routes or the, wh wherever it comes from. And it struck me that there's, as you pointed out, there's a limit to this. Not everybody is following best practice in or, or what's perceived as best practice. Even when there is such a thing as best practice, people don't follow it, as <laughs> we know. Uh, so there's a limit to what's available, available open and openly. There's a patchiness to how different people are doing it. But also, it feels as though at some point in the case study you presented, it wasn't open, that it started with information from a state. <laughs> we don't know who that was, so I presume it was closed information. So I'm interested in any thoughts you have about when, how open open source is, or uh, if, if there's a sort of a, a, a synergy between open and closed sources. And also kind of in a secondary point, I'm sorry, I'm throwing a lot at you, so just re respond in whatever way you want. The sense that good governance uh, sort of relies on open source data collection. So Companies House in the UK is an example of that. Um, and then if you have that sort of open uh, information, uh, then that can facilitate open source research and that supports good governance. So this could be a really useful mechanism for supporting other issues. Um, I know, as I said that, people could pick me up on whether Companies House does or does not do what it intends to do, but I'll hand over back to you now, <laughs> Dan. To uh, thank you. Uh, I, yeah. Uh, oof. Uh, where do I begin? Um, yeah, uh, okay. I'll, I'll, I think I'll first address this sort of closed sources um, uh, question. Yes, um, this specific case does start with a, uh, a UN member state um, sort of uh, giving the panel uh, a piece of information that says, "Hey, you might want to look into this." Um, that, that's uh, yeah. So this uh, this is what it is what it is and for a lot of for a lot of sort of um for a lot of cases uh of sort of a proliferation concern the the inciting incident does start with something like this another thing another thing that sort of um that doesn't need that doesn't need to have to have that sort of like closed loop uh, que uh queuing is that sort of um co um sort of uh Public uh, open uh, open source investigators like us have the ability to to sort of like uh, sift through vast amounts of data um, in, in in shipments um, that allow that of key uh, HS codes or key sort of uh, that have red flag 
um, ex behaviors of concern for us to start queuing up an investigation from there. Obviously, a lot of those things will start um, will start from uh, will start from a you, you'll start from a massive list like uh, like we've done. Um, I've shown you here even uh, that. So imagine if so, and that was even with a closed, very very targeted queue. Um, so imagine having having to do that with a massive uh, data set to start sifting through. Um, so that's, but it, but it is possible and uh, more sort of automated workflows can help with that. Um, the second point uh, about sort of uh, the limits of open source and sort of the ethics behind it, I, I definitely agree. There are, um, there, are, there are sort of different communities of practice sort of coalescing around um, this, grow, uh, this growing sort of uh, field. And we don't necessarily know who each, everyone is. It's kind of like a, a bit of a dark forest um, theory of like uh, different actors kind of in, in the dark forest, not knowing what everyone does. Um, and because of that, there's no real kind of um, uh, gravitation towards any norms. But I think, I think that is slowly to happen. I think, uh, I think different uh, community, different sort of um, uh, like-minded uh, practitioners are coming together um, and start talk, and talking about uh, what they do, how they do, how they do it, like what we're doing here and starting to talk about the questions of, okay, right, how is your GDPR compliance uh, going? What, what ethical mandates do you, uh, do, uh, do, you uh, do you go through? Um, do you have a right of reply process? Um, things like that are all, are all parts of um, uh, uh, sort of in, uh, quest, questions and conversations we need to have as a community. Oops. Uh, thank you. You know, really, really great answers uh, and very exciting. Uh, that thought that that uh, uh, standards are emerging uh, from from this field. Yes. And on that note, Dan, thank you very much for your uh, comments. I'm going to hand over to Dan Plesh because I think you might be following quite closely on thinking about communities uh, in in tracking systems. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks very much, uh, Henrietta. And again, two fascinating contributions to add to the ones you've had in the previous webinars. Um, I would like to really provide a bit of a uh, personal and institutional backstory as to why the project and where we think it might go and what we think the, the need is. Um, in the late 1980s, I had a commission from the uh, MacArthur Foundation to cover and report on the conventional forces in Europe uh, and open skies negotiations in Vienna in, in the late 1980s. And, uh, and at that time, which was still very much the Soviet Union as a going concern, um, uh, there was uh, uh, a certain amount of NGO and academic discussion and development of uh, possible future arms control mechanisms but certainly I think if anyone had said that we would have achieved CFE and open skies and indeed the Vienna Accords on competent security building measures and indeed the creation of the OSCE within a very few years uh, I think no one would have really thought that was that was credible um, and yet uh, there was interaction between political realities um, some visionary political leadership uh, and uh, the development of a, an expert um, a community uh, that helped in, enable that. Now, as we know, uh, sadly, tragically, uh, these architectures has, have been successively dynamited uh, into rubble in, in recent years. And I don't think that I have to uh, remind this audience uh, about, about that. And very, there's very little left. At the same time, uh, we you know, see uh, a renewed um, weapons competition in the, the nuclear, the hypersonic, the conventional, etc., at the level of the P5 and uh, their allies, uh, and an intensity of uh, what we used to call low intensity conflict, a high intensity if you happen to live there, of course. Um, uh, and that presents an objective problem of uh, do we think this is going to continue indefinitely without it all ending in a really major uh, conflagration between the P some members of the P5 
Well, I think generally speaking, that isn't a safe assumption. If we all, uh, we would like to have assumed perhaps that, that at some point there'll be responsible people who would come to the fore. And indeed, some of my friends have a project on the responsible behavior of nuclear weapon states, which given the leadership of uh, some states at the minute, looks to be uh, a slightly ironic undertaking, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, so it's in that environment that uh, the, the scrap project, particularly with the involvement of students, uh, has gathered momentum in recent years. And a key part of that is, well, uh, what would be the um, 21st century equivalent of the sorts of confident security building measures, verification mechanisms that were really pioneered in the, the 1980s? And it was interesting, uh, Henrietta and I had a succession of interviews with um, members of the Iraq inspection regimes, UNSCOM, uh, UNMAVIC, um, in recent years, which were very uh, illustrative. But I think one of the lessons that came from that to, all, to us was that um, many of the problems that they encountered were, would in the age of Google Earth, and with the sorts of approaches being demonstrated by participants in this webinar series, really much reduced. Um, that the ability to conceal um, was, uh, and indeed the concealment wasn't successful. The inspectors actually did a good job back in Iraq. Um, the silver lining of that uh, unhappy episode, um, that the potential there is to, um, I wouldn't say easy, but there is a great deal of potential now, there's a, a huge cognitive dissonance because while, let us say, the world educated community um, accepts as a viable proposition the development of science to apply to uh, tackling the climate crisis, there is no understanding within that uh, broad spectrum of uh, civilization that. Uh, controls on weapons uh, are feasible uh, or in any sense uh, uh, technically viable, uh, which I think is a real cognitive dissonance given the expertise that we've heard in the recent weeks and indeed the practice of some of some 30 years ago. Uh, so rather than facing um, bemoaning the uh, dynamiting of open skies and so forth, what we're about is saying, well, whether it's uh, at at the level of uh, ongoing uh, tragedies in Syria or other parts of the world, or the emerging, the continuing uh, competition by video. I just saw uh, a video Russians had released of a supposed hypersonic missile um, test. Uh, this kind of virility uh, symbol competition between the powers uh, gaining, gaining ground again. Um, it's, I think, very badly needed to start introducing into the discussion the idea that uh, controls, uh, transparency is viable. Um, who might the, the, uh, the, the recipients of this be? Now, of course, uh, the late uh, dear uh, Professor Joseph Rockblatt. So Joseph Rockblatt, um, you know, I think they didn't coin, but uh, sought to disseminate the idea of citizens verification. And what we see in the, the different components that have been brought into the seminar series is that this open source non-governmental verification actually is developing and existing. And hopefully we can, in the, uh, the months and the year ahead, start to help um, develop this as a network. Now, Hans Blix, who we talked to, um, uh, spoke of the, the idea of creating a service, which I think is an interesting idea, uh, in a sense, to develop a service, for example, for the use of parliamentary libraries, uh, looking to track not just low intensity conflict, but the behavior of the P5 um, and their allies. One can see this mirroring, to some degree, the uh, resources that uh, major national intelligence op operations are providing to their governments behind the scenes, but also feeding into possibly future treaty regimes. Uh, some are 
the actors we spoke to, Rolf Achaeus, I think favors the idea of a service uh, for the Security Council. Well, uh, given much, many people's jaundiced view of the behavior of the Security Council, that isn't perhaps a top priority. But one can see there's a, a spectrum of potential user groups. There is a, uh, a very war broad constituency that, let us say, has a general understanding that environmental monitoring is essential and practical as a means of dealing with the climate crisis. And it's into this um, cognitive dissonance and this policy vacuum that I think that we can start to introduce uh, these ideas. Because without them, I think we face, as it were, a recurrence of, a, in some ways, a worse recurrence of what we saw in the, the high Cold War, um, but without um, the uh, expert community uh, looking at strategic solutions uh, and geostrategic solutions. And that I think is what we hopefully we can uh, start to start to facilitate in the work that we're engaged in. And I would just feel encouraged because certainly uh, when I and some of the colleagues were first engaged in these issues, in the late 1980s, we couldn't possibly imagine what was achieved. The fact that you know, we have managed to establish an effective, if incomplete, uh, ban on explosive nuclear testing. Um, and that despite all of their problems, there is significant positive impact from uh, the various uh, smaller weapons conventions, uh, program of action on small arms, um, the cluster munitions and landmines bans, all without exaggerating, it have had significant positive impact. Uh, and these, I think, give us some hope and some tools that we can build on. And this exercise, hopefully, is a, a, a step towards creating such systems. Um, and with a bit of luck, we might just be in time. Thanks, Henrietta. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, uh... So I'm mindful of the time. It's three minutes to three, um, and we, I, I, always, I, I intended that from three we'd, we'd segue to a more informal set of conversations. So anybody that wants to start thinking about making an in-person comment or question, um, please do be thinking about uh, raising your hand or alerting me in some way. Uh, Dan, this was great. You know, so you reminded us of the possibilities of global governance, that things have been achieved globally that people didn't think were possible, and they, they helped to build relationships, stabilize uh, geopolitical tensions at difficult times. Uh, but you also reminded us of some of the problems uh, in that area that, you know, not least that many of these treaties are deteriorating or being seen to deteriorate uh, on different levels. Um, and so you introduced this idea that we, we've heard before in the webinars about whether there's a chance that the technological opportunities afforded by this open, this, this new approach to open source research, as well as the old styles of open source research, whether those sorts of transparency measures can help to support the development of global governance structures. And I was just wondering if you have any uh, ideas about whether and how uh, the open source research done by non-governmental organizations can be harnessed within international organizations or groups of ne states negotiating on uh, different issues. Um, and uh, really, uh, I, I ask that because I'm very mindful that the open source projects that we've heard to date are doing great stuff and they're getting heard by the people that they want to get heard. So it's how to take it if you've got any thoughts about how to take it to another uh, level and a, and a different set of audiences? Well, uh, that is a challenging question. I think if we're able to develop a, a network, I think we can look at ways of uh, seeking dialogue with uh, different international bodies, whether it's uh, the Interparliamentary Union, um, OSCE or NATO Parliamentary Assemblies, or finding our way into the uh, the margins of uh, ASEAN, um, NATO, um, other similar bodies, and indeed the um, the influential think tank community. But I think at some point we have to find a way to have a dialogue 
perhaps with uh, the through media with um, people concerned about the and aware on the environmental side uh, in a sense to say well actually this is a much this is a much more practical proposition even than controlling the climate because the technologies involved uh, well, to say if it comes to counting battleships uh, to be crudely um, or tanks it's a relatively simpler operation than greenhouse gas uh, emissions and controls but it is something which uh, I, I you know how to do if I guess if I did it we'd already have done it and I think the idea is the idea but if we are able to uh, develop a, a network community with an interest in this that itself I think can show uh, a broader community what is possible and what has been achieved. Great thank you and uh, 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 that gives an interesting sort of it might also be that the tracking weapons or tracking security related issues could actually help with the climate uh, change things. It's not maybe either or. Um, I've had um, a uh, raised hand from Richard Jolly. Um, would, would you like to speak now, Richard, please? Thank you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I want to make one point about the power of research and people outside the UN. When we did the UN history, we identified that there was not one UN, there were three. The UN of governments, the UN of the staff members, and the third UN of outsiders pushing the UN, doing research, all of that. And we, when we looked at the UN's work over 70 years, we found that much was stimulated by the third UN. So keep it up, I've enjoyed this session. Uh, thank you. That's a really Thanks for the uh, encouragement. Exactly. Yes. Um, uh, Dan or Ali, would you like to come in on any of these thoughts about uh, whether and how the technologies or the transparency can be used uh, in to promote global governance? Um, Hi. Ali. <laughs> I'm. Uh, I, I find it difficult for me to think from an ACAPS perspective because I previously I worked for six years on, on small arms and light weapons. So, <laughs> um, so everything that is, um, and specifically on, on the international instruments uh, to uh, control instruments. So I'm, um, I find it really hard to take an ACAPS perspective. <laughs> That's okay. We don't mind if it's not ACAPS. Um, Just <laughs> but I, I think there are certain um, certain parallels in the sense that um, what what ACAPS um, does is basically trying to fill a certain kind of information gap or or um, data gap. I guess the the big difference is that because it's in the humanitarian field, it's uh, less sensitive and less contested um, it's probably also less delicate to find to find a way in and, and being he heard and that organizations see see the value of it because they actually want want that information so if I compare that to do my experience with small arms and light weapons um, the what what was said about the three U UNs I think that um, also fits well with my, my experience there. Often the problem is the government, UN basically, <laughs> get the foot into the door. And, and, but even there with um, persistence, I think uh, over time often um, they see the value of, of, this in, of, of research, independent research and how it can be based on, um, on, on findings of such research. To, to move the organization forward. It's just very slow. <laughs> Over. Um, yeah, uh, I, I guess from Alpha's, uh, KCL's perspective, um, did, I, think, I think sort of uh, open source uh, communities, communities of practice definitely have a space to sort of inform, uh, to be part of this sort of the surge of societal verification. Um, it's, it, it was what uh, originally sort of, in, uh, sort of the impetus behind um, how a project alpha uh, grew uh, as sort of 
uh, just sort of uh, bring a level of um, bring a little analytical and uh, technical expertise into the into the open source field that uh, that was um, burgeoning um, to sort of uh, to sort of feed that back into uh, either the um, uh, international bodies or, uh, or or competent authorities um, where there's sort of proliferation for um, uh, incidents of concern. Um, so growing growing that community is um, is probably the best um, thing we can do right now. And part of doing that is sort of bit of a sort of uh, recognizing sort of what we are all about, um, understanding a, a building a rallying around a key sort of uh, ide ideas of uh, community standards, uh, rallying, rallying around key ideas of communities of practice and profession, uh, professionalization um, and ethical standards. I, I think that will be the most um, sort of the biggest uh, enabler for uh, for sort of accelerating this um, this endeavor. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, it feels as though things are kind of starting to come together. That we, we've heard people talk before about. Uh, thinking about uh, community best practice, thinking about ethical questions. Um, and uh, I'm aware that maybe more has been done on the ethics uh, and the uh, codes of practice on, in the humanitarian sector, but I really don't know very much about that. Uh, Dan, you're nodding. Ali, do you know anything about, the, about <laughs> that, that field of open source research? I think Berkeley published some standards which that I will be looking at. Yeah, Dan, you're nodding very much. So please, can you come in and say more about yeah. that? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah so uh, the Harvard University, um, I think around 2013, started the Signal Code, um, which is trying to uh, draw upon current uh, in, uh, current sort of human rights and legal instruments that are that are uh, that are in current that are in current international law, um, and sort of like pick pick that towards how does what does that mean for humanitarian um, uh, sort of data work? Um, what 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 rights does the individual have for, um, when they're when you're doing a when you're doing a, 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 a like a rapid uh, needs assessment? Uh, how like sort of what are the rights? Of, how how should you handle how how should you handle that data? Um, so uh, so that's kind of like the humanitarian side, um, and sort of around about twenty. 17, 18, 19, and until now, sort of um, University of Berkeley have sort of um, uh, tried to sort of coalesce uh, and draw some of um, draw some of uh, sort of that idea into what they're doing in the Berkeley Protocol, which is kind of uh, a, a sort of a best practice of how would a uh, a member of the public conduct a open source investigation ethically, um, sort of looking into sort of planning your investigations looking into targets um who what their what their rights are what your what your what your responsibilities are both for the individuals involved in, in what you're collecting about but also sort of like what your ultimate mandate is towards uh, so those are all things that you have to, um uh, sort of as mm, I, I think like uh in the sort of the wild wild west of the open source world back in 2015 16-ish um we never had to sort of think about, but now it's sort of something that absolutely. I think you, in order to sort of establish yourself as a as a as a force for, um, as a as a credible force for um, societal verification, I think you definitely have to have uh, have to have these in um uh, in order. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's that's really helpful, and I'll follow up. Uh by looking lots of that up after the session. <laughs> um, I'm interested though, to kind of take it a step further and maybe also Richard Dolly, you might like to come back on this. Um, so in your presentation, Dan, you pointed out that China has to be part of this and, and, I'd, and I'd, I'd extend that. <laughs> the rest of the world needs to be part of this. And uh, in the majority of my conversations and the majority of the speakers we've had at these webinars have been absolutely brilliant. There's no disrespect to them. They've tended to be from Western, uh, countries um, and so is there a problem with Berkeley taking the initiative and calling it the Berkeley protocol in, if we if we are wanting to roll it out to other people um, and also I think uh, Richard you, you gave a really uh, helpful idea about the third UN and I wonder if we're going to really harness societal verification if 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 an extra layer of protections are needed um, for people. Um, so in the Pugwash work, uh, from the British Pugwash group, sorry, uh, in the 1990s, there was some talk about 
developing systems to protect whistleblowers internationally. And I don't know if, if anybody feels that that's important if, if, if as this community grows bigger and bigger. Uh, <laughs> Uh, radio silence on that one. Uh, Dan, do you have anything to say about those sorts of ideas? Uh, I think they're, they're very ambitious like much else that we know, but that we've been discussing. Uh, I think there is, of course, we can see in the financial world and the corporate world, a huge problem of whistleblowers in general. And you've only got to look at the crackdown in... Um, China in Hong Kong, or the fate of um, uh, American whistleblowers um, in the war on terror and information gathering. So you know, finding the, the political will is very difficult. There is though, I think, the, the fact that a large amount of uh, data really is publicly accessible. And if I had to kind of put it into a, um, a cartoon, uh, version it would be to to pick up the military balance from the International Institute for Strategic Studies, uh, drop it into uh, a machine reader where uh, each of the weapons types could be paired up with its imagery uh, and then apply that to uh, satellite imagery. As I say, this is a, a cartoon caricature of a process, but there's a very large amount of um, data that's available and the potential to upscale the different nodes, I wouldn't say fragments, the different very imaginative and energetic and useful nodes that we've been working with over the last few weeks shows the potential for a, uh, a global system which doesn't have to rely upon uh, whistleblowers in particular, particularly. And while we are concerned with um, to use, a, I'm afraid, a slightly hackneyed expression of mine with the, as it were, the, the teenage drinkers of uh, proliferation in um, Korea or Iran, that the, you know, the real problem does remain the, the five confirmed alcoholics, um, you know, sitting in the bar bemoaning the, teenage, the teenagers. Uh, and, you know, we, we have to uh, keep a focus on them and, and their habits. And that is, I think, uh, relatively more practical if we're, you're looking at uh, tracking major, uh, major weapons platforms, particularly in times of crisis. And I think part of the precedent is, goes back to the original arms control confidence security building measures between NASA and the Warsaw Pact in the mid 1980s, when there really was an understanding that things might get completely out of hand and introducing systems for uh, military exercise notification, which still actually very quietly do, do remain intact within the OSCE region and have had quite useful um, application in crisis in Ukraine and elsewhere, and understandably don't want to attract media attention. But I think that these processes are things that uh, I think can be enhanced. And once, in a sense, where it's a ha in phrase again, excuse me, I keep trotting them out, but the phrase the whole world is watching, uh, I think does, con does constrain the uh, ability of um, uh, decision makers and policy to act as if the whole world isn't watching. If we're looking at whether it's the South China Sea or activities on the Russia-Ukraine border where both sides are flying bombers up and down on a regular basis now. So I think that there is an awful lot of uh, uh, potential without getting into the whistleblower world. And excuse me if I've given a, a typically long and rambling answer. No, it's a very interesting answer. And I, you know, for what it's worth, I think we've been feeling our way towards this uh, through, through different conversations as well. The sense that if you start institutionalizing and forcing collaborations to happen, maybe you lose some of the rich creativity and flexibility that open source uh, verification can give you. So uh, Dan and Ali and Dan, you've all, all kind of given a sense of maybe all organically growing community is, is really the best way uh, forward. Um, I'm just going to say we've had another question uh, 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 sent to me, um, reminding us that the motive of the UN was to promote unity and strength of the international community 
and to promote peace and equality and, and asking about the role of the UN Security Council. Now, I'm going to kick this one off, actually, because it, 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 it refers back to the conversations Dan mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, we interviewed some senior figures uh, in uh, the uh, uh, verified disarmament of Iraq, so UNSCOM and UNMAVIC. And one of the ideas that came from that that hasn't really been taken up uh, was to make the UN Security Council, um, give, give them access to verification expertise. Um, uh, it, didn't need, it wouldn't need to be, because of this would, be, uh, would, be, would need to be fleshed out. And I wonder if the panellists have anything to say about the role of the UN and uh, if, if you think mechanisms for getting open source verification directly to the Security Council might help or the sort of more happenstance um, world that we're living in. Uh, as, as Ali said, it takes time to build these sorts of connections uh, which is undoubtedly true. And I also think it takes time to build good treaty regimes. They don't just appear overnight. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to reflect on whether the Security Council uh, uh, should be factored into these sorts of considerations. Uh, I, think it, I think it could, and I'll bow to my, my colleagues in a second. I think it could, but I think actually a, a, a service that... Um, the non-permanent members and the Secretary General and the GA could draw upon would be something which is, relatively speaking, quite practical to create um, and, and to build. Uh, and indeed, it might be something that the network, if we're going to establish it, might be engaged in, in the same way it would be available to parliaments. And then out of that, one might see the practical application uh, and possibly the, the P5 getting interested as well, ultimately. But the Secretary General can't go out and do it him, himself. Um, the non-permanent members don't really have the resources, you know, unless they're a state like Germany, which is so tied in um, to the P5, it wouldn't want, as it were, to bring its, put its intel on the table. But, but developing, you know, a, a, a non-governmental uh, or semi-governmental resource that is publicly available, then in a sense there isn't a problem for the Secretary General using that. Great, thank you. Um, I think, Ali, you were going to come in? Uh, no, oh, sorry. <laughs> Dan, you were going to come in. Sorry, I, yeah. Um, I think um, the, the UN panel of experts system um, for a long time has been, has kind of ostensibly tried to be the sort of this, this sort of stopgap measure of um, uh, of whenever there's a there's a particular uh, either disarmament or um, or sanctions regime or um, you have sort of, uh, the uh, the UN Security Council sort of um, sort of constitutes a panel of experts to um, uh, to sort of give give yearly updates on, on comprehensively on a problem set um, so um, for example in South Sudan. Um, in uh, in Mali, in um, and also in the DPRK, um, so that and that and that system where the panel panel is constituted by um, by a, a sort of the, the the composition of the panel is often sort of the rate limiting step and how and how this operate how this operationalizes um, in my opinion um, it uh, the 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 selection process for for these panel esteemed the experts. Who are supposed to be um, a class investigators or incredibly knowledgeable, um, uh, either civil servants or um, or from people from the uh, people from the NGO or investigative world um, about a particular problem set. Um, those uh, those always percolate up, um, but it's also a process of the, of this panel trying to navigate the sort of the internal. Um, Sort of dynamics of what um, uh, Professor Jolly uh, said about sort of the, the the first and second UNs. Um, so there's like a tiny bit of the third UN kind of trying to navigate between the uh, between the first and um, between the first and uh, second. Yeah. So um, we live in a messy world, don't we? Uh, thank you. You know, I think that's, that's a very interesting extra point about the panel of experts that there already exist mechanisms for harvesting uh, bits of information. Um, but they're also, uh, but they're just as uh, constrained as any uh, any other root members of the public. Right, right. 
Um, so I'm now going to each ask each of you. We've got we've got ten minutes uh, 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 if we want to go to time. Um, but I'm I'm interested um, to think about your views on whether it's desirable or practical to think about scaling up the open source work that you do. Uh, so we've talked about, yes, it would be nice to have some sort of network to maybe share stuff, but can you see possibilities of, of extending what you do, more of the same, and, and if so, uh, what would help with that? So clearly money would always help. Um, but why I'm asking that is a sense that uh, are, are the interconnections are the overlaps between different groups actually potential synergies and could time be saved if uh, if some sort of cooperation could be built into things um, uh, obviously this is a massive question and you might think that you you, you don't really you, you can't answer on the spot um, uh, uh, but there's also a sense I think you know I, I, I don't know I don't do open source research but I think collaborations can be really tricky. I think there are often turf wars between different groups, if we're honest, and there might not be a magic wand to streamline different work. So I'm interested to get your thoughts on uh, how you would like to see your own work scaled up, if that's possible, or if what we've got at the moment is just really great as it is, uh, and, and this sense that an organic emerging community might be the best we've got, yeah. Uh, Shall I ask Ali? Would you do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I. <laughs> um, when when your your first email reached us um, with your request, if you're interested um, in in um, participating in a in a webinar, so I I must admit, first we um, there was some head head scratching going on because we we didn't really see how how we fit in, and then we had our our discussion, and and I think what I um, what I realized then, and this is also why I emphasized that in my um, presentation, was that what we can contribute to the discussion is a lot about um, how we try to solve things through um, procedures, processes, that this, this is more the um, innovative aspect. And I think in that sense, um, because I, I still feel like we are uh, coming from a very different angle than probably most other organizations that there is a very small small risk of um, that we step on anyone else's toes or, or, or vice versa. But there is a big potential to for us to learn because as I said, we are um, also currently experimenting with a data collection for building data sets um, in terms of content. They might probably not be that helpful for, for what you are doing, but I think there could be a very valuable exchange just in terms of, of methods because we all have tried things and know what worked and what didn't work. And I think that would be for, from our side, certainly very interesting and, and I think could lead to a very useful exchange. But then again, as I said, we, we are very unlikely to step on a, a, anyone, anyone's toes. Oh, well done. <laughs> Ali, um, and, and I'm, in, I'm always interested by this, this sense of maybe ACAPS is, is uh, not central to weapons tracking, because I just think humanitarian <laughs> issues are really front and centre of, of tracking uh, harmful technologies. Uh, and so the information you, I, I could fully imagine the information you collect could really uh, uh, enlighten wider tracking systems um, yeah, so <laughs> that's going back I, to our discussion. I completely yeah. agree. Um, just speaking from a personal perspective, um, I uh, I had a bit of, I had a bit of non sort of um, non NGO background, but a lot of my sort of current open source techniques um, and sort of like uh, an experience um, comes from sort of doing crisis mapping uh, from the sort of uh, disaster response um, and sort of humanitarian disaster response space. Um, there's a, there's a lot of sort of synergies current currently being developed in terms of like. Um, are using uh, rapid response tools um, uh, and sort of data sets and, and uh, sort of a lot of different uh, sort of synergies between uh, sentiment analysis to uh, to sort of rapid needs assessment. A lot of synergies between sort of um, analyzing um, sort of uh, trade uh, trade flows into uh, into looking into comp uh, looking into conflict economies and and, and um, so I think those are incredibly sort of important synergies that we have uh, that sort of that needs to sort of be connected. Um, uh, and I, for one, I'm completely welcome sort of um, 
the, 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 a, an avenue where communities of practice who don't normally sort of up, uh, come together on a, on a, in a common watering hole should come and meet and, and sort of like check each other out, uh, see what, uh, see what, see what, how, how, how each, each other is doing things and, um, and learn from each other. Uh, great, thank you, uh, Dan. You know, it's, it's very, very encouraging, this session, uh, I'm finding. Um, this, this sense that uh, uh, there are, there's, there's room for everyone. <laughs> uh, there's room and there's opportunities to learn from everyone. Ali, that was a really practical sense that you gave of uh, procedures, processes, methods. Can, you can learn from each other and, and maybe get better, maybe save each other some time. Also, I was really struck by your presentation where you said that uh, your work is done by trainees, short-term trainees, and then presumably they go out into the world and they have a richer understanding of data collection uh, and what to do with it. Uh, Dan Liu, I, I would imagine that Project Alpha also trains a lot of people. I have to say in my research conversations, often uh, people lead back to a connection with Project Alpha. There's, there's, a, there's a, quite a few hubs, I think, in, in, this, in this ecosystem. Yeah, so, so is that something as well that you think that, that, that is important, kind of training another generation in a very open-ended way? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. great. So we've got four minutes to go. Um, and uh, Dan, I'm going to invite you to reflect on uh, the, the sort of uh, networking ideas that Ali and Dan came up with. Uh, sorry, there's Dan's. Does everybody know who I'm talking to? Dan, Dan Fletch, yes. please comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just feel very encouraged uh, at a time when there's very little in the external environment to feel encouraging about um, the fact that we are having analogous conversations with people such as yourself and uh, veterans like Richard Jolly and Tariq Ralph. Um, you know, in the sense, aren't saying, no, 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 young people, don't be so silly. <laughs> um, or we tried this 50 years ago and it didn't work. Uh, or any of these other things. We're not getting that sort of reaction at all. Uh, and I think this is, uh, has a lot of potential. And I feel very heartened that what really was a, um, I wouldn't say a passing thought, but uh, uh, Olamide and uh, Martin Butcher, and, uh, Henrietta and uh, some of the students just uh, talking these things over. Uh, and we've been working quite a lot with the Vatican who got interested in the idea of, of a freeze. Um, and well, you know, from freeze into tracking and verification, looking as a way to do, to get back up for that idea. Um, and so well, then, you know, Henrietta with uh, her usual aplomb started pulling you all together and it's I think it's it's uh, more than we could have uh, hoped at this stage which is quite exciting really. Great, uh, thank you Dan, I was listening as I was quickly typing, um, uh, so uh, I agree you know this has been an absolutely fascinating session we've, we've gone into all sorts of different areas in more detail than we've had a chance to in previous sessions and kind of brought together a sense of the practicalities, the technological possibilities and some of the political needs and maybe what next for the sector. Um, I've posted in the chat details of our next webinar which was in a couple of weeks. Um, we've got uh, another great set of practitioners, um, this time from Imperial College London uh, and RUSI and the New York Times Visual Investigations Unit. Um, so please do join us for that if you can. Um, and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, bye. Uh, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Ali and Henrietta. Tremendous. Thanks.